Hello, everyone. Nice that you made it after having uh, just having lunch. So I know it's a hard task. And Oliver, please don't fall asleep. But so um, right, I am Hannes Reinecke. I am team lead for storage and networking with SUSE Labs. And um, well, yeah, various other things, and also active on the upstream. Linux kernel for primarily on the storage area, so like SCSI and NVMe. And nowadays also a bit um, networking, thanks to FCOE. And uh, also um, being gradual being drafted over to this whole security thing and TLS encryption and blah, things you wouldn't know. Anyway, that's not the topic. The topic today is how to mess up new topology with CXL. Um, the one of the main areas we have been focusing on in the recent years is to trying to get the performance uh, performance of the storage layer up to speed, i.e., matching that what the hardware actually can. And it turns out that this is a surprisingly hard topic. And what is more surprising is that you now suddenly have to worry about hardware details. So the whole point of us being working on a high-level language and doing abstractions is originally that we precise do not have to worry about hardware. But now we are slowly getting back to the points where we have to. So I thought, hmm, maybe it would be a nice talk to just see how this came about, because the whole idea was, well, we don't have to worry about hardware. So, to start with, um, how do we even get here? So, there is something called NUMA, Non-Uniform Memory, ac Memory Access. Okay, hmm. and why? So, originally, the servers were easy. You had your CPU up there, you had your North Bridge, as it was called, um, basically the memory controller hub, which was talking to the memory bus, or in newer things, there was a graphics card, a high-speed graphics card directly attached to that one. Then internal bus to the South, uh, South Bridge to do the actual I.O. for PCI and whatnot, and then also the legacy I.O. down there. So nice design, easy, superb. Nothing to worry about. So, but then, they found, well, we are actually having on, running on a bus topology, because back in them days, bus topology was all, was all the rage, so you have one connection to all your peripherals, and everyone had to, be, had to talk to uh, via this bus, and so you had to address the, uh, the individual pieces on the bus and sending signals back and forth, bus arbitration to ensure that you're the only one speaking to that device and not, not the other device, and so on. Horribly complicated and everything, and they found that eventually, well, it's actually getting in the way because all I.O. have to cross this poor bus. So um, what they did then is they moved from a bus topology to a point-to-point -point topology, which means that each device is connected directly to the connector, or then actually, which became more a switch. Advantage is there's only one device you have to, you're talking to, so you have the full bandwidth on, on that link. Disadvantage is, well, you have to have several links for each of these devices, because, well, that's what point to point is. So, and, um, so to make this a bit more efficient, they, they actually moved now the PCI attachment into the CPU. So, as you can see, the north bridge is gone. Functionality of that one, meaning, meaning the PCI interface, moved into the CPU core, as it were, and the CPU would be talking directly to the PCI bus. For efficiency's sake, and also to re reduce the number of, of lines which you, have to, uh, which you have to use, and so on and so forth. And the rest pretty much stays the same. You still have the source bridge, which now speaks to the lower speed PCI, is still there, but then for the high-speed ones, you can, uh, your, uh, the CPU can talk directly via PCI Express to the individual slots. Performance improvement, nice, dandy, everything grand. Nothing to worry about, nothing to see, move along. So, and then they figured, mm, you know what? It's nice that we have CPU, but um, we are actually now hitting the physical limits, and we can't just increase the CPU speeds as we were want to. So we are stuck at 4 gigahertz. But uh, 
selling a new CPU with the same speed is not really making you any friends and puts the marketing department a bit of a disadvantage trying to sell CPUs which are the same speed. So hmm, we need to do that. So what to do? All right, if one CPU doesn't cope, just add more CPUs. So what they did is they invented multiprocessing and essentially just packaged more CPU cores on the same thing. So that way you can scale because you can just add more cores on that one, which is nice. And um, also you can maybe get a higher parallelism, you get a higher parallelism within the CPU itself, so because you have multiple threads which you can uh, deal with. The overall infrastructure pretty much stays the same, so yeah, just the CPU itself which got modified, so yeah, okay, so mm, 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 yeah, okay, you can do that, okay. But then they said, mm, yeah, well, mm, but if that is not enough, we might need, to, uh, might need to do more. So they said, all right, just duplicate the whole thing. Just put the very same infrastructure on the side and have a link in between. What could possibly go wrong? Um, so, well, well, what? can go wrong is that we are still running a single image system. So Linux actually still thinks, or the OS actually still, still thinks, that these two CPUs are actually just one with more threads. It's typically not, not aware that there is something like the link in between which you have to cross to do things. So mm, yeah, so it actually makes a difference on which side that thread is running. Plus. Well, uh, you need to access the memory, and so while you can access the memory from the local CPU, accessing the memory from the other CPU is ever so awkward because you always have to cross the UPI link. The same incidentally goes for the PCI devices. Because you can, of course, while you can talk from each CPU to each PCI device, if you're unlucky and hit the wrong PCI one, you actually have to cross this, the other CPU to actually get to it. So, yeah, it's not really that. So, mm, so mm, okay, yeah, it, mm, it just works. But then you figure, well, we need to do something here. So this is, um, we can't just pretend that this is all one system and you don't need to worry about it. We are not mainframe. Mainframe actually does it. Mainframe says you wouldn't see any new effects whatsoever. It's all covered up by the emulation. All right, it just means you just slow everything down or what. All right, so, but they say, no, don't worry, don't worry. Well, okay, we don't worry. But on x86, we actually have to worry because, um, well, we actually can see it, we can measure it. There's a, a nice tool from Intel um, called MLC for memory latency checker, which actually does that, which checks the latency of the individual NUMA nodes, how, um, um, how fast they can access the memory on the other side, and these are the results from that one. So that's on one of the machines, and there you can easily see that if you want to access memory from the same node on node zero, you have a latency of 120 nanoseconds. These are nanoseconds here. Curious enough, if you do this very same one on the CPU number one, you get 114. Go figure. Don't know why. I would have thought that the system is symmetric, but apparently not. But if you access the offside memory, you see, all oh, right, the latency increases. And that's the latency for the UPI link, which you're hitting here. So you can actually measure that, that, they, that there is a difference. And um, so if that weren't, weren't bad enough, the CPU can only work with local memory, because the CPU actually can only work with the memory in the registers, because that's the only way that what, what the CPU can work. So you actually need to move the memory to the registers. To cover that up, you have cache caches to ensure that mm, the memory is actually there, i.e. the data has to be in the caches for the CPU to work. But if the CPU is on a different core of, of a different socket than the other CPU where you moved over, you actually would need to move the data from that cache into that cache, or rather, push the data back from the cache into my memory, then let the other CPU access it and pull it back in their cache. That is horrible. That actually takes time. Uh, but sadly, you wouldn't even see it from the program model, as we have as abstracted everything away, you wouldn't, be a, you wouldn't be aware that this is even happening. It's all covered by the hardware. Normally, you wouldn't even know that this is happening. Unless you start measuring performance, then you figure out, hmm, that's, that's weird here, so what's, what's happening? and you do see weird numbers. And so, so they said, mm, right, we need to do something. 
So they programmed something in the hardware telling you, oh, right, this is actually the layout, the physical layout of the machine. In HCM, in, uh, Intel, it's called, that's, these are the HMAT tables. That's an HPI table telling you the physical layout of the system, which means that now Linux or the OS can see, oh, right, now I'm running on two phys phys physical systems. So, I'm, uh, so they introduced something like NUMA nodes, they, so you can say, all right, this is one side of the system, which has the one set, a set of latency, this is the other side, which has another set of latencies, and if crossing the boundary, I'm hitting a higher boundary, uh, I'm hitting a higher latency. That way you can map it out quite nicely and you can tell the system, right, this is the layout and this is how things should be. Okay. That is the hardware, which is good. But then as the hardware changes, turns out, well, we can't just use the old programming we did and hope it'll just work. Mm, not quite. So, this is now again an abstraction. So, originally, again, it was quite easy, but it was quite simple. We have the CPU here, here's the PCI device, here's the memory, here's the cache for the CPU, and yeah, fine, no problem there. But then, as the CPU, as we started adding more cores to the CPU, we actually had to move the cache from the memory into the CPU itself. Because well, it's actually it needs to be CPU, it needs to be core local. So at least L1 cache will always be on the same chip. So you now start splitting off the cache too, which again, in this case, still doesn't really matter because at the end they all will accessing the same memory. So you could be, um, so you wouldn't really see any difference when moving threads back and forth. Um, but still you still will need to move the cache. So if you move the, th the thread from here to there, you still would need to move the cache, detail, the cache contents from here to there. So it actually would make sense to see, right, can't we just align it? So they, now, uh, they then said, all right, we can just do a local memory. Um, we can have something like, uh, like local memory to ensure that right, we always will be staying on that thread here. Thereby we won't avoid, um, we will avoid cache threshing and um, the system will run more efficiently because we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to co copy data. But just entering the slide to tell you, all right, mm, please stay here and don't move. So, but we still haven't looked at the PCI device. So if we don't do anything, PCI will just do I.O. with however the PCI device is connected and it'll sort it out. Yeah, right. The memory didn't even sort it out. How should they sort it out? So it would be an idea as also the PCI device will have several interrupts. Ideally, as many interrupts as you have cores. You can align the interrupts to the cores themselves via the uh, mechanism called interrupt affinity. So you can actually nail the interrupts, meaning the PCI device, to this, uh, the, uh, the cores themselves, which then speak to the same memory. That way you have a nice alignment and can, and can ensure that everything what you do will always stay, or the, or ideally, on the same CPU, and you get the best possible performance. If you do it like that, and you have th such a system, that's actually the best, best you can get. And from then on, it can only get worse. Because, when you now move over to a, um, to, a, a, to a real NUMA machine, well, you still have only one PCI device. Out of necessity, it needs to be connected to something. And if you remember back them slides, they move the PCI controller into the CPU. So if you connect a PCI device, that PCI device is actually connected to a CPU, to a CPU. Meaning that one, well, suffer. So, sorry, mate, you lose. You have to go via the, via the interlink to talk to the PCI device. But again, as this is a single image, the image assumes, all right, the PCI device is connected to the system. So even they wouldn't know that they're actually talking to a PCI device with a higher latency. And what's more, well, there's nothing they can, they can do. Because, well, <laughs> they need to talk to the PCI device. The only way to avoid talking, uh, crossing the interlink is not talking to the PCI device, meaning we will need to cut out this size for doing I.O. and just use that one. Hardly efficient. So either way, hmm, that's bad. Well, not quite. Um, again, we have the NUMA node now. If we now introduce NUMA nodes, now we are at least aware that's maybe not a good idea to schedule things here if you want to do I.O. 
But still, if you want to use all cores, all threads, well, you, mm, you have to scatter on that one. And, but what you can do is you can do a uh, NUMA alignment of the, so if, if you actually go for NUMA alignment, okay, can I go back? Maybe this one, yeah, so. So this one still is a single image system. So again, everyone would, while you can align the memory to the thread, it wouldn't know where the thread are. So if you schedule within the thread, um, you wouldn't know whether you can schedule it from here to there because it makes a difference, obviously, if you move it from here to there or just move it from here to there. So you wouldn't be able to, uh, to uh, you would have a performance impact then if you move it uh, across the boundary. If you introduce a new, a new um, topology, the scheduler is aware, oh, there's a boundary. I rather, should cross, I rather should try to stick on the same one. And you can allocate the memory according to the NUMA node that you know, all right, it will be on the same node. And if you do that, you can actually measure that. This is now the, RUM, uh, the BRD, the RUM, uh, RUM driver, uh, which um, I added a new parameter that it will only allocate data, uh, allocate memory on the node, on one single node. And then I had an FIO process to that node that it will only use CPUs on that node. And these are the results which you get. So if you nail it to the same, if you allocate on the same NUMA node and have the threads only running on the, on the same NUMA node, you are actually getting a noticeable better performance out of that. So, but these were just dealing with the I.O., not really with the I.O., uh, with the memory, not so much with the I.O. latency. Because the, well, the I.O. is just there. There are no descriptions for the I.O., how, how slow or how fast the I.O. is. It's just, well, it's there. Talk to it. And, um, it would be obviously, I mean, if you want to scale out, we want to use all possible CPUs, clearly. But as we just seen, these CPUs might not be the best to use because they might need to cross the interlink. So this is dragging down performance because you, you're essentially forced to be to do an inefficient I.O. because that's the, there's no other way. Only, so, and, so, and this is how it looks like if, if you, uh, for the PCI device, while the PCI device has several interrupts, the PCI device will try to allocate an interrupt per thread, or per core rather. For that side is okay, but allocate an inter interrupt per core on this side, meaning right, even the interrupts have to cross the, inter uh, the interrupt handle have to cross the QPI link. So now everything is going via this poor QPI link and drag it down performance. And the way to solve that one is to, well, again, duplicate things. Just add another PCI device. And then both sides can talk to each other. But as you can see from this rather complex topogra topography, um, yes, they can, but they have too many lines to talk to because um, for every core, one line will be inefficient. The other one is good, so that one, that line is cool, but that line here, oh, I have to cross the interlink. Same here, that line is cool, but that one, again, going by the interlink. Uh, but mm, how do I figure out which one to use? So, of course, there's an easy thing to just say, right, we could maybe look at the, at the NUMA locality information, and maybe that'll tell us something, but only, so maybe, so, hmm. And that was easy. Now there's CXL. So CXL is essentially a PCI dialect. So it's CXL is specified on top of PCI and is in trying to move PCI to become protocol aware that PCI roughly knows what it does and what is happening on top of that PCI thing. So, it tries to sort of combine memory and I.O. And um, for that, it defined three types. 
type one is a cache coherent device with no memory. Fuck knows what that should be. Possibly an accelerator, but mm, after the specification was done, no one was really sure what on earth are you trying to do here? Then there's type two, which is cache coherent devices with memory, so primarily GPUs, because that's precisely what you need for those. And then there's a type three, which are non-coherent devices, which essentially just, just well, either memory devices or I.O. devices or you name it, something which has, which are just connected via the bus don't, but don't really have, require a full cache coherency. And to confuse matters even more, there are three pot protocols specified. So the one is CXLIO, so that's an IO protocol, oh, surprise. Then there's CXL.mem, which you need to talk to a mem type device. And then there's CXL.cache, which is the cache protocol for the cache coherent devices. So why? Why do we even want to do this? Well, it is actually not a bad idea because that finally allows you to push more things onto the CXL bus than, previously, than you previously could. So previously, CX, uh, PCI was just an I.O. bus. So this was basically a hyped up thing for connecting I.O. devices. As you now introduce additional use cases like cache or special memory, there is a possibility in the, few, in the near or further future to actually combine all I.O. pins on the CPU to only speak CXL, such that CXL is the only protocol the, uh, the CPU speaks and not, as we have now, about three different protocols, like you have the PCI, PCI pins, you have the interlink, interlink pins, and you have the memory, uh, memory pins. So there's three type of protocols the CPU has to do. So if you can combine all of them into a single protocol, you vastly reduce, the, or the hope is that you reduce the complexity on the CPU and be more flexible what the CPU should do. Because which protocol is run on which, uh, which pin is, well, essentially a configuration thing. It doesn't really matter, it's all the same underlying protocol. So you're far more flexible what the CPU could do. You would, and the hope is to drive down engineering costs because that's the only type of interface you need, and you can configure things to do whatever it should like. So that's, I guess, a bit the hope in the back why we want to do this or why people would want to do this. However, we are not there yet. So, the first devices you actually get are memory expanders. There is Samsung has already done a PCI device, a CXL device, which essentially is just a memory expander, so memory via CXL. What is also there, if not yet, then in the very near future, are in fact switches, that you can combine several things together via a switch. Which again is actually a nice thing because it reduces complexity on the CPU. So you can reduce the number of I.O. pins on the CPU and just have a switch fanning it out again. So driving down costs on the CPU side. Hmm. And well, obviously the idea is to use GPGPUs here and use CXL for attaching GPGPUs. <coughs> but to my knowledge, that is still an idea and they're not there yet. Why do I have two CXL, CXL switches? I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> nah, I'm right. Okay, anyway. And there's also something, and what you could also do is you can do a device pooling. So as you now have a switch, you can connect the switch to several CXL hosts, all talking to the same switch. And then you can move devices around and configure things and blah, blah, and everything is nice and configurable. And so you're Disintegrated infrastructure. <laughs> ah, sorry, did, did I misspell it? Right, okay, so that is a C, not an O, just so that you know. Okay, um, so, but if we do that, then going back to a model, it actually will look like this. Then you have your new node here, on that side, with a PCI device, you have your normal node here with a CXL bridge and something attached to it, like the memory. But this memory now has a noticeable different latency than the other memory up here. So, hmm. right, we should probably map it to a different NUMA node. 
because, well, it has that's what the NUMA nodes are, are for. So it will be, well, a CPU less NUMA node, but Okay, still a human node because that's non-uniform line. Non-uniform memory access, which it, that definitely is. The question is though, what are we using this memory for again? Because we just lined out everything according to the thread and the hardware, trying to, uh, to allocate everything on that hardware. Allocate everything on that hardware. That is doing <coughs> what? So, Okay, as people found, yeah, this might be an issue. There's, um, has anyone here to the talk to uh, talk by Oscar um, early on? That's the memory tiering coming in here. Well, I said, oh, well, we actually now have different memory types and we can do fancy things like we can move memory from here to there because it's you know, memory thing. It's a memory tier thing. So we can do memory promotion and demotion. So essentially, if there's hot memory, it will be local. And if the memory becomes stale over time, we can demote it to the other tiers. So, and we specify these other tiers by the access latency. So this one has an, the access latency from here to there is about what, 200 nanoseconds. From here, to, from here to there is about 700 nanoseconds. So from here to there, it will be 900. Okay, fine. So, and then I have memory here, which shall be demoted because it's not needed anymore. Okay, we demote it. Where should we demote it to? Well, as I'm not quite sure, to the next closest one. So we denote, demote it to the next closest one, which happens to be that one. So we now allocate from this one. And then we start trying to allocate memory, real memory from here, because that's the closed one. If I go, oh, blimey, someone actually allocated all the memory. Thank you. And then suddenly you figure out, oh, I need to do a demotion there. Okay, so demote to here. And then, right. And then suddenly you have this one using this memory, because that one stole all my memory. So there is some improvement to be had. And um, so, I hope, to, um, I, I hope to be proven wrong by someone who has ma more idea from memory management than me, but I fear this is what's going to happen currently. There is some room for improvement. And to make matters worse, so that is... So uh, that's basically, again, that. So yeah, mm -hmm. so th there is a local and remote memory, and you can then demote things, yes. Um, the other problem is that the pre promotion and demotion memory, well, it means, well, you have to copy memory because that's what promotion and demotion means. Meaning it only makes sense if you're sure that during the time which you spend to copy the memory, no one will try to access it, that memory which you're just copying. How exactly do you know that? that in the, in the next seven or nanoseconds, no one will access that memory? Hmm. We know, we can see into the future. No, actually not. Um, so this it vastly depends on the time you spend copying data over and the relationship basically and the time when the next data, when the data will be accessed next. So there's not only a bit of guesswork involved, but also the relationship between the latency suddenly comes into play. It surely makes sense if that is vastly slower, because then, yes, you want to copy it over. But if, if it's not really that slower, so if, say, this one is now 200 nanoseconds and this is another 200 nanoseconds, well, it's about the same thing. So why would you copy it over? You can just use it directly. Hey, come on, don't bother with that. So uh, there's a lot of tweaking to be involved, and I'm not really sure whether this um, promotion, demotion thing will stand up once there's real hardware. Because mm, always remember, there at us, of this time, there's only very limited hardware to available. And we really will have to see how the then available hardware behaves and how much latency it'll have. Because it's, while it's clear that it will, be have, it will have a higher latency, well, the idea was, back in them days, to actually combine it all. So, but this only works if the latency is reasonably low. Otherwise, where's the point in combining? So 
there's a chance the latency will decrease because that's what, what they're working on. Then again, and, but if the latency decreases, this whole promotion demotion scheme really doesn't make sense anymore. Just leave it. Just do it. So, things to be had. And that, this will then, and you can even have more fun, which is if you now start to add an IO device. Because we can balance out the memory access because we have NUMA abstraction. But for IO, it is non uniform memory architecture, not IO architecture. We have no way how we could specify that this latency here is vastly different than this latency here. This is. It's a PCI device. What do you care? Just access it. Uh, well, yes, I do care because that's actually quite slow. But how do I tell it? Well, it's not slow. It says 64 gig Ethernet there. It's a, it's a 200 gig Ethernet interface. That's not slow. You can use it. No, rather not, please. So, hmm. How do we solve it? Um, there's someone who wrote a latency tracker. That um, because there is already an infra a QoS infrastructure in a block layer, which you, which already calculates latency. It turns out, so you could use that to track uh, the latency per each device, and select the device based on the lowest latency. So that's that's actually quite a nifty interface because it's asynchronous calculating, so the, there is actually no, um, no performance impact or a very limited performance impact if you do that. Um, but you're able to figure out the best path. I did this on my fiber channel setup. Um, that's the 32 gig fiber channel setup. A dual one, the one uh, which, so, and this is, the top one is, the, uh, the round drum is the standard one, just pick any path which you have. And what you can see here is that, well, yes, you can do it, but the variance is massive. <laughs> because you either hit the optimal path or the non-optimal going by the interlink, which screws up every measurement you would like to, uh, you're doing. So yes, while you get some results, I mean, any statistic would just laugh at it and say, these are not values. I mean, if you have a variance double the size of your, uh, of your actual measurement, you can as well leave it. It could be anything. So and that's what, just what's showing us, so pff, don't bother. But if we, get, if we actually check the latency and select the path on the latency, the variance is getting down quite a lot. And we are even getting better. So, and this is only also reflected on the, on the IOPS, meaning the um, IO operations per seconds. Same, same story here. So we're increasing on the IOPS because, well, the latency is reduced. Yeah, surprise. But we're even going down on the... Um, on the variance, so we are being far more predictable and we're getting a better performance. So yeah, that is okay, like. But still, you have to measure it, which is uh, arguably a bit of a naff thing because it means, yeah, well, you first have to do I.O. in order to do I.O. <laughs> Not really. So, um, it's another way. Could we do something like generalized NUMA things and have CPU-less and memory-less NUMA nodes, something, and tell that whatever would be cool because then would just we could just extend the NUMA principle over to I/O, and we could leverage that and we can could calculate it upfront without having to rely on measurement. So would be a good thing. Infrastructure is there, too bad, but okay, let's see. So and that actually was it. So, um, I hope I haven't bored you to death, and now I would be open to question. Yes. So, uh, what would prevent you from limiting the allocation of memory for demotion to nodes with uh, zero CPUs? No, there's nothing limiting it. The question is, do, will you choose them? Because if you have a closer memory, you will try to allocate from the closer memory first. I, know, I think he's asking... Why not just forbid it? Like, say, if you want to demote, the only pool you can take off is the one with zero CPUs. 
I'm sure, you could do that. Yes, uh, always providing that there is a pool with zero CPUs, because it might also be that you're running an actual NUMA thing, like a one of the Cray clusters, where you have a vastly complex topology, where you really have near memory and near memory is all, and basically, so you have to allocate from some node with CPU because that's the only node which you have. Well, you could swap. Sorry, you could swap in that case. Uh, I have uh, somehow a bad feeling asking Cray to swap. I mean, I'm not sure why that's going down well. well so no, um, it's uh, so this is arguably a rather specific setup, because typically if you speak of Numa, you actually have nodes with CPU and memory on it, and you have lots of them because that's why you actually need Numa. So um, not sure. But yeah, sure, it would be a possibility, but not in general in the general case. Okay. Can I ask a second question? Sure. When you mentioned that locking, yeah. uh, if you if your memory is that really relevant if unless your memory is read write? Hmm? I mean, Sorry. It, it, it's basically in last consequence a race condition, right? Yeah. So, and the only race that matters is somebody is writing while you're copying. Um, no, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's not the race condition problem. The problem is it's pointless. Why do I copy over data when I still when I actually use it? I don't need to copy it then. But I wouldn't know, so I have to wait a certain time before copying it out. Y you do that only under memory pressure in the first place, right? Memory pressure on the local node, which is not the same than overall memory pressure. Oh. So it could well be that your local load is highly loaded and all the other 10 nodes have nothing to do. It's not really memory pressure. It is on the local node. On the local node, yes. So, yeah. Mm. Oh, there's a queue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. You, you, your talk focused on uh, CXL memory yeah. being used as memory yeah. and, and essentially a DRAM replacement. That, that's where you, you were with the discussion. And to me, you have to start thinking, at least for the first use cases with the, the initial hardware generations, the data, where does it come from that you put on that memory? Yeah. Is it generated from something that is uh, in memory compute or is it data from a, a huge data set that yeah. doesn't fit in memory. In which case, that data comes from storage, which has at least three order of magnitude slower access rate than yeah. your slow CXL yeah. memory. Yeah. 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 So why would you care that your CXL memory is actually slower than your DRAM? It's still going to be way, way faster yeah, 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 to sure. do I.O. into that CXL memory and, and do your whatever data ma manipulation in memory uh, from there. Oh, and there are valid use cases for that. Oh, yes. So um, I would love to have that discussion <laughs> next time in, in uh, Salt Lake City, because, yeah, that, you're perfectly right. I mean, if I have to copy over la large da data, does it make sense to try to keep the NUMA local? Because we might not have enough memory on the local NUMA node. All, all hyperscalers, by the way, they randomize the memory allocation because there's no way to control predictably the NUMA allocation, so it's random. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, also sure. because from the IOs going uh, to, to the same storage devices connected to, of course, different nodes. From different nodes, that's uncontrollable, so everything randomized, and you get uh, actual predictable performance. Yeah. 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 So CXL, the first one, yeah. probably is going to be just an extension of DRAM, and nobody really cares that it's going to be slower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite get uh, what's the improvement from a software perspective uh, with CXL. Because in theory, you could implement a lot of these things on a PCIe switch. Yeah, you can. So, and then I wonder, are we doing anything with the software issues around that? Because I think things like, for example, um, the ability to have a segregated address space so you can connect the same device to several systems will be a much more useful feature than, I mean, from a hardware perspective, sure, 
CXL can do a lot of improvement. From a software perspective, I don't see any advantage there. Well, sadly, no one asked the software guys. If you were asking me, going to multi-CPUs was just fault in the first place. We shouldn't have done that. We should have stayed with single CPUs, and they should just improve the, the CPUs. Yeah, the, the number of the issues you get just because you had to introduce locking, the whole multi-thread processing just becomes because they didn't get the hardware in order. Yeah. So but, no one's asking software guys, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's part of my point. If you, if you have a single image with a single yeah. CPU, then yeah. there's no locking. And you could actually have a device talking to multiple systems and moving memory around. Like you, you basically tell the hardware, I want this much memory here, this yep. was much memory there. If yep. it's connected to something uh, like a fast PCI link or CXL, it won't matter if it's fast enough. Uh, you will be able to basically just move the physical memory from the perspective of the system. Yeah, it will be high latency compared to a copy, but still. It's not that we haven't looked into it, but it turns out it's surprisingly hard, or rather that uh, you had unintended results, because the biggest problem is that the characteristics of I.O. devices and memory are vastly different, in the sense of vastly different. And... Um, it is not easy to combine these tools, which you would need to do if you suddenly start to transport well memory type devices via PCI, which is precisely what the CXL is about, that you can do it. Because the typically PCI is geared up for well doing large transfers and transfers fast. That is that's what it's really good at. Uh, doing small transfers is not really what it's good at because, well, hmm, there is a fixed size which you can trans and transport, and the only size which you can transport on that PCI bus. So bitwise access via the uh, PCI bus tends to be a very, a very inefficient. So you'd rather want to have large, large chunks transporting over. And um, so they try to do that via RDMA, meaning uh, via InfiniMan. That what is basically what InfiniMan was about originally. But even there, it turns out not that easy. That uh, in the end, nothing beats local memory. And so it's, it's, yeah, it would be useful and would be sensible, but the practicalities are actually quite hard. But uh, if, if your memory is actually all over something like CXL, yeah. then you are not really making any difference. You simply change the allocation of memory. Yeah, sure. For, uh, for CXL, it wouldn't matter. That's one of the advantages of CXL, that you actually can do it. That you but can. From, a, from a software perspective, yeah. uh, this, there is no advantage. Well, you got more memory, yes, it does. Uh, what, what I mean is, f from a software perspective, nothing really changes. You don't need to change anything, that's for sure. I mean, that's, that's kind of the point of this presentation, that yes, you, don't have, to, you maybe, don't have to change anything, but if you want to be efficient, it might be a good idea to change. May, but Yeah, sure, but may, maybe we want some change. For example, uh, one, one thing I was working on a few years back was... Uh, using uh, PCIe link to directly move memory because, uh, copy memory because we could not reallocate the memory yep. because CXL was not there yet. Yep. Yep. And uh, w one of the many issues we had is there is no software interfaces or the ones that they are, are for virtualization and not well suited to actually telling an application you got your memory because this, the operating system could allocate things in advance and assign it to the thread, but you have some la quite some latency to wait for the transfer to complete. So we could simulate memory moving uh, using uh, an hypervisor-like abstraction. So a process will hold the memory for the uh, uh, guest application. The application will map that, uh, but there was no way to directly tell the application, here you go, you have this memory. It will have to go through the kernel, always. And there it was, this was the only operation that actually needed to go through. And in the event that we get something like CXL, this is still true. You get, you, you get 
vastly superior methods behind scenes, but you cannot really take full advantage because on the software side and, and the CPU support for uh, waking up a thread without talking to the rest of the system is not there. Well, the hope is that things improve with CXL because especially the memory can directly expose. It will just show just normal memory node and um, you can then ah, do something with that. So yes, um, um, I have been informed that. Um, I have to cut you short, unfortunately, sorry. Um, but maybe another one or two, or just uh, do these two. No, it hasn't. So, and the other talk, Patelli hasn't started because there's no one standing here. <laughs> yeah, that could be. What do we care? Yes. Um, so if I want to figure out how the system uh, looks like, I usually look at the CPU distances reported by Linux. But in my experience, those are usually ma just made up numbers from the system integrator. Yes. Um, but now we get other devices which basically need to have comparable numbers because I need to figure out, uh, figure out what the distances overall are. How do we make sure that those numbers are comparable? Like how do I actually get able to figure out which device is the nearest? Trust me, they are. <laughs> <laughs> the, vendor, the vendor will make sure. Exactly. And if we need to measure, how do we do that for arbitrary I.O. devices? Well, uh, for the memory? Yeah. No, no that's, that's what I said. There's a tool called MLC, like Memory Latency Checker, which does precisely that, namely trying to access. You have already, the good thing is, you have the Numa topology in the sense that you have numbers. So there's a Numa number, and each memory has, is attached to a Numa number. So, each, you, so you can figure out, right, this memory is on that node, and this memory is on that node. And then you can just measure the transfer speed from CPUs on that node. So you can actually measure, measure this as you know the abstracted hardware by Numa number. And then you can measure it, and then you can figure out the distance here is that and that and that. So that you can actually measure. And we can do that for arbitrary cryptography accelerators without memory. Uh, how, would you, the memory, uh, how would you measure the memory transfer to something which does not have memory? Yeah, but your propriety. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and yeah. that's that's precisely the thing. That's what I said. Yep. So measuring a latency, all a latency measurement which you have is memory based. So you have to have memory to talk to. But if you don't have memory to talk to, you can't really make leisure, uh, make uh, measure latency because well, how would you do that? But you are proposing to integrate those into the existing NUMA interface, right? So we need. So yeah. Okay. Okay. So you, you, oh yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing. So, but that I before I tried to do that, I'd rather want to talk to PCI expert how PCI cards would look uh, would like it if I tried to throw out tons and uh, ten thousand writes at a PCI config space oh, or reads, but still reads. It still it still is a transfer to that device. Do they hold up? Look. If you say that's safe, then it's safe. Yeah. Okay. I'll send you the dead cards. Hmm? No, of course not. Just off fronts. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, do you have a tool for that? No. All right. Uh, too bad. Would be cool. Why? Sorry? It's synchronous. Yeah. So that yes. part for virtualization is very close. But you rarely talk to the config space itself. No one does it anymore. Exactly. So you only need to do it once, and then you have everything else's memory mapped, and you don't need to talk about it anymore. So that's not really an issue. Just doing once during initialization, and then you're done with it. Don't you? Yeah. 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 You ha will have to provide tons and tons and tons of PCI config space. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So yeah. 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 
<laughs> so related to this um, discussion about measuring the I.O. latency, on your final slide you raised the idea of having something like NUMA for these cases. And I believe a couple of years ago I raised a similar topic um, related to um, AIML accelerators, mm -hmm. also having like various weird kinds of ad memory um, mm -hmm. localities. Um, and of course the, the, the main issue I see is that with NUMA you have a static um, definition that the system vendor can then specify in their ACPI tables, which could cover like the uh, PCI or CXL host controller. But as soon as you plug in any kind of cards into those slots, then you have a variable that cannot be like pre-determined that way. So do you know of any other uh, trains of thought regarding those cards like PCI bars or any kinds of ROM reading config space to carry such information? No, not not yet. So this is. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, just pass it on to SBI and let them do it. No, don't. Um, no, really, I don't think so because currently it's well, CXL is well rather new, and um, I haven't really seen a CXL switch yet, and um, so. We basically have to wait and see what the future brings. How the, first and foremost, which device we'll actually see, and that also then defines what we need to do. Because if there are no CXL IO devices, we wouldn't need to worry. True, but it's not necessarily restricted to CXL. It's also applying to you know PCIe three, four cards today, right? Yeah. Well, for that, as I said, you can get by with. Um, um, Directly, measure, directly measuring the latency or do something. So yes, that would work there. Well, today you get yes. by with proprietary drivers that have inherent knowledge about how a specific card is done, right? It's absolutely not generic and not transparent to an operating system or even user space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wouldn't in this case it be enough to know the distance of the slot to the nodes? Because no. after the slot, it's basically every, for, all slot, uh, for all nodes the same, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, sure, but it will be the same for all nodes. Well, yes, going yes. So, um, the slot, yes, right? but the problem is to yes, you you are right. Of course, once we, you are out of the system, then the latency would be the same for each and everybody accessing it. St but still, the latency would contribute to the overall latency. So you would still would need to know what the latency is out or outside of your machine. So, because in the end, you would need to have the overall latency. If and how you could specify an overall latency, that, of course, is another question. So, how do you even do that? Because, well, if you have. It, not for. No, no, not for allocating, but which. For, for which path to use. It's, it's not so much, this is not so much for allocation, but, the pro, uh, but it will influence which site you should be using if you have several to pick from. Because the whole discussion becomes moot if you just have one path, if you just have one PCI device to talk to, because then guess what? Yeah, you have to use that PCI device, come what may. So really it's only a question if you have several PCI devices to, to, to choose from, then it becomes an issue. If you don't... Exactly, yeah. Every time we introduce an architecture change, this sort of question comes again up. And the thing is probably it should be the protocol itself 
that gives us information because there is cases where the latency could change, for example, if the uh, underlying link can change size or migrate. It yeah. could be that the link is actually connected through Ethernet. We don't really know that. There could be tons of things in between. The other thing uh, I would like to, to point to is uh, the abstractions for uh, specifying how the connections are there are not perfect. Mm. Uh, and I saw a much better model into the concept of memory servers in microcanals because that gives a slight advantage in that you don't really need to know uh, details about how the memory is implemented. So a virtual um, NUMA could behave exactly the same as a real one. Um, and, and it's a lot better for when you need to implement a new technology. If you want to share memory over, let's say Ethernet again, uh, you can do that. Yeah. And the system doesn't know. Um, yes. Um, sure, it's always better to discuss things away until it's, it's, it should be dealt on a different level. At one point, you have to do it if you want to be efficient. At one point, you have to have the information. What is the most efficient way? You can say, all right, I have an abstraction which doesn't need to worry about it, but that just means that the levels below it needs to worry about it. So you're not getting away from the overall question, how? No, so, sure, 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 but uh, I so wanted sure, to point be, out I'm sure that it can be abstracted away, and that was basically the idea behind the Numa node thing, because um, to, uh, that is the idea behind Numa node IDs, because these are just abstracted numbers which have nothing to do with nothing. It's just a nice way of abstracting but away the hardware. That assumes the, re the relationship between uh, different components of the system is kind of uh, static, and if you attach these properties to things like processes, it will be possible to match them end to end and have them so you could compute the, all the details in the chain and you could have a process in a different machine, see the memory remotely and know exactly what it's getting. Yeah, I mean, they're already working on that one um, with the big little, little big, big, big little architecture thing. Um, where it suddenly makes a difference where the processes are scheduled to, because not every CPU is equal anymore, but there are rather different capabilities. So that's already been worked on. And there might be a chance of expanding that one to include new topology and whatnot. So, yeah. All right. I guess we are done now. And. Um, Thank you all very much for your patience and for everything. And